We want to invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning, actually to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6 is where we're going to begin this morning. And then if you want to kind of mark your place there and flip over to Acts chapter 24, we're going to we're going to take a look at a couple of different passages that I think fit very well together this morning. Many of you may have heard the term, the early bird gets the worm. And many times we use that in our life, and sometimes we use it to try and get our children to teach them to get out of bed and complete something or do something that we want them to do. Uh, you may have used it a time or two. There's actually a follow-up statement to that, though, that says, the early bird may get the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. Meaning, of course, that the first mouse got killed in the trap. Now, there are times in life when learning from others' mistakes and us keeping a steady pace can be good. But in the spiritual life, it's good to keep a pace and not concern ourselves with who finishes in what place. Just listen to God's direction, follow Him exactly the way He wants, and in His timing and His speed for our life. But this statement of the second mouse gets the cheese has been used sometimes by individuals to justify, and we want to look at this word today, to justify procrastination. Now procrastination defined is the act or habit of delaying something that requires immediate attention. Now, I want to use a little bit of an illustration to, to further explain this. There was a, a farm boy that had accidentally overturned a wagon load of corn in the road. And the farmer who lived nearby came to investigate. And he, he said, hey, Willis, he said, uh, forget all your troubles for a spell. Come in and eat dinner with us, and then I'll help you get the wagon up. And the young farm boy said, that's mighty nice of you, but... I don't think Paul would be too happy. And the neighbor said, oh, come on, son. The farmer insisted. He said, it'll be okay. I'll talk to your Paul about it. And he said, I don't think Paul would like it. Well, it ended up that the boy went ahead and went in and ate supper with him. And, and so uh, after the, the nice meal, Willis, the, the farm boy, thanked the host and he said, I do feel a lot better right now, but I just need to go because Paul's going to be real upset. And the, the neighbor said, don't, don't worry about it. He said, he'll be okay. If I need to, I'll talk to him. He said, by the way, where is your dad? And he said, he's under the wagon. <laughs> Procrastination can be a terrible thing sometimes. And it can hide behind many different windows. One of the most eloquent windows disguise, uh, disguises that procrastination can use is that we need more information or more research about whatever it may be. Sometimes we say this from a spiritual sense. We say, well, I'm praying about it. And our statement of I'm praying about it is actually... I really don't want to do it, so I'm going to pray longer and see if God changes His mind. That don't happen, by the way. When God leads you to do something, He has you prepared, He has you ready, He knows the right time, we just have to follow through. So sometimes we use this statement of, I'm praying about it, and it becomes a procrastination type statement. When Christ or the Holy Spirit stirs the heart, Procrastination actually mutters, wait for a better occasion. I want us to read today 2 Corinthians chapter 6 as we look at Paul's encouragement, especially in verse 2. When he says, now is the favorable time, now is the day of salvation. From there we're going to take a look at Governor Felix when in the book of Acts when Paul was in prison and and Paul stood before Felix and basically gave his testimony, and he, he acquainted Felix, although he already was familiar with it, with what they called the way, which was basically believing in Jesus Christ. But we see a lack of acceptance with Felix, a procrastination, and as far as we know, he never accepted. And I wonder if that's the condition of some today. 
We've heard it. We actually know it. Heard it many times, but we've never submitted ourselves to it to the point that we've said, I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Read with me, if you will, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul says, working together with Him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, as I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. Now I want you to, to notice that verse 12, if you would, for a minute. You are not restricted by us. Basically, Paul is saying, I have poured out my heart, I've poured out my life to you. I've told you about Christ, I've patterned it in front of you, I've took beatings for you, I've went hungry, I've given you everything that I can give you. You are not restricted by us. There is nothing that is holding you back from accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. The only restriction is you yourself. I wonder if that's where we are today. Maybe you're here this morning, maybe you're watching online today, one of the two, but you've heard the Word so many times in your life. You've heard even God speak to your heart, call out to your heart. You've been under conviction before. You've maybe even grabbed a hold of the back of the pew and not let go because you're afraid that if you did, you'd walk the aisle and come to the front. And yet, the only thing holding you back is you yourself. Paul gives encouragement not to put off till tomorrow what you know that you need to do today. This can be accepting Christ as personal Savior, or it can be following through with something that God has been leading you to do in your heart for quite some time. It can be forgiving someone for something that you never have forgiven them for. Whatever it may be, Paul is primarily speaking here about being a faithful believer or follower of Jesus Christ. And I would ask you today, before we go any further, have you done that in your life? Are you living that life today? Have you committed yourself to be a faithful follower to Jesus Christ? And if not, I'm going to tell you right now, the only thing holding you back is you yourself. You can't turn around and, and say, well, you know, so-and-so didn't kind of give me this, and I don't really feel good about them, but, so I just can't give my life to Christ today. The most common statement that we hear, well, I can't go to church out there, or I can't worship with them because they're just a bunch of hypocrites out there. But you know what? When we stand in front of God, God's not going to say, you know, I know there was a hypocrite that was in church with you, and therefore you get a free pass. God's going to look and He's going to say, why should you enter the gates of heaven? And I don't know if this is exactly the way it's going to happen or not, but I have it pictured in my mind that Christ is going to step out and He's going to say, because He called upon my name, and He is one of mine, and His name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I don't know if it happens that way or not. 
But it'll be something like that. But I would ask you today, can you say that about your life today? Paul says there's nothing that's in the Corinthians way. Paul's done everything he knows he can do. It's now up to them. Notice again that verse 12, we are not restricting you, but you're restricting your own affections. I want to ask you now, because we could stop the service at this point in time, is God dealing with your heart now? And if so, what's preventing you from coming? And if you need to in this moment in time, why not get up from where you are, come to the front, pray, ask God to be your personal Savior. You see, we don't have to have an official invitation. You can come at any moment in time. The altars are always open. You can bow right where you are and you can pray exactly where you are today. You see, procrastination can cause issues in our relationship with God or with even beginning in a relationship with God. Have you began a relationship with Christ? Look at Acts chapter 24 with me, if you will. Acts chapter 24, verse 22 is where we're going to start. And again, Paul's in prison. He's having to appear in front of uh, Felix, who's the governor, and there are people making claims against what Paul is doing. And the only thing they can really accuse him of is actually sharing the gospel and living it. That's, that's basically their only accusation that they, that they have. And they've already made their case. And we get to verse 22, and, and Paul is about to somewhat give his, uh, his declaration of who he is and, and what he has done. Look at verse 22. Uh, Paul is actually, I'm sorry, Paul is actually given his declaration. I was going to read a few verses before that, but we're going to start in verse 22. So we find here, but Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, when Lysias, the tribute, comes down, I will decide your case. Talking about Paul. And then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. In other words, Paul could have visitors while in prison. Verse 24, After some days Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul, and he heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. That's procrastination at its finest, by the way. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul, so he sent for him often and conversed with him. And when two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by uh, Portius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Now I want to look at this life of Felix, or of, uh, uh, yes, Felix for just a moment. There's three aspects of procrastination that I want us to look at that not only affected him, but affect us today. Whether we are fighting the battle of becoming a believer, or whether we are just fighting against what God is leading us to do in our life. First off, notice that procrastination actually neglects God's righteousness. Paul proclaimed in Romans chapter 3, verse 22, that God's righteousness comes to those who believe through faith in Christ. The key word there is those who believe. He did not say that it comes to those who enjoy hearing about religious issues or to those who like to sit and listen to the message of Christ being preached. But it comes to those who believe through Jesus Christ. In other words, what I want you to take away is it doesn't matter how many messages or sermons you've sit through, until you believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it has done nothing in your life. So I don't care how long you've been in church. I do care how long you've been in church. But when it comes to salvation, it's not about church attendance. That comes after you get saved because then you want to be here. 
It's about submitting ourselves to Jesus Christ and believing that He is the only way. Verse 26 says that Felix sent for Paul often, and he conversed with him, and he apparently debated the message of the gospel. But we know he had other things on his mind. He was hoping Paul would bring him money. In other words, he was distracted by worldly things. Similar to Felix, there are many individuals that will listen to theological teaching and doctrinal sermons or any just sermon that they hear on the radio, but they never draw the conclusion that they need to accept the Savior, Jesus Christ. And they've sat in church maybe all of their life. They've went to Sunday school, but they've never come to the point where they've said, I need Jesus as my personal Savior. I cannot do this on my own. They never see the pressing need to change. They never reach a verdict that God's righteousness is what's required for the sacrifice of our sin. Of course, those that have not delayed the decision to listen and accept Christ's invitation have the sacrifice through Jesus Christ. They have grace and mercy. Their life has changed. You see them from a different perspective because now God's grace and mercy is working in their life actively, changing them, molding them into the person God desires for them to be. As long as they're being obedient. You see, they realize the need to change their life and they respect the righteousness of God and realize that the only way to have that relationship is through the Son, Jesus Christ. In a book written by Lloyd Ogilvie, he writes about a conversation he had with a fellow student by the name of Alistair. He said that they would often sit close to each other in the library and would eat lunch together many times and would have discussions about faith. The student, Alistar, knew little about church and had not made a profession of faith in Christ. He said that several times their discussion would bring Alistar to the edge of the decision to accept Christ. But he would never move forward with that decision. Mr. Ogilvy said that one day after discussion had focused on grace... At the end of that conversation, Mr. Ogilvy took a pen and he placed it on the table and he told Alistar that he needed to make a decision of whether to accept Christ or not. Mr. Ogilvy told him that when you decide or if you decide to accept the free gift of grace and commit your life to Christ, then I want you to just pick that pen up. He said that for an hour they sat in silence with Alistar just staring at the pen. A friend came walking by while they were still sitting there and noticed that they had been sitting quietly for about an hour looking at this pen and he asked what they were doing and Alistar replied that he was trying to decide whether to become a Christian. And the friend replied and said, why not do it now and get on with your life? Several more minutes went by and suddenly Alistar reached with his hand and grabbed the pen and said, Now is none too soon. Today, are you in a point where you need to say in your life, Now is none too soon. And I'm not talking about just salvation either. I'm talking about just following God in the path that He's chosen for your life, whatever that may be. Maybe it's turning away from some worldly things Maybe it's actually submitting to something that you know God's been leading you to do. You see, Jesus provides a way of salvation, but we must accept it. He gives us direction in our life after becoming a believer, but we must acknowledge it as being good and true and right and follow it. It's not enough just to hear it and listen to it. You can listen to it all day long. If you're going to travel from here to California, you can you know, open up one of those app things on your phone and put it in and get the shortest distance and you can set it to where it starts talking to you. Most annoying voice you'll ever hear. Did you know you can change that from a female voice to a male voice? Did y'all know that? 
Man, it totally changed my life when I figured that out. <laughs> Sorry, I got a little off. But, you know, you can listen to those things. You can listen to them tell you how to get from here to California. But unless you start going, you're never getting there. You can hear people talk about how to become a believer in Christ, but unless you make that effort to pick the pin up, you're never getting there. Same way with being obedient to Him. Secondly, this morning, the, the second effect of procrastination that we find from Felix is that it causes us to set aside the necessity of personal morality. So in other words, procrastination allows us to set aside things that we know are really right, but we just kind of continue on in them, or know that they're wrong, but we continue on in them. Notice verse 25. It says that Paul presented Felix with God's righteousness and his self-control. His righteousness and his self-control. Now self-control was something that troubled Felix because he suffered from unbridled self-indulgence. He was a man whose moral compass drifted toward self-indulgence and moral decay. A Roman historian actually noted that Felix was a man full of lust. Maybe we find ourselves at a point sometimes where our life is spinning out of control and we, we realize that we need some self-control that can only be patterned from the life of Christ. See, a person struggling with procrastination struggles with an indifference to moral convictions and virtuous actions. In other words, we struggle to call things sin when they are sin because we want to think about how or if it really is sin. In other words, we put off the decision. And because of that, we continue in sin. Going by the example of Felix's life, we see that because of his delaying decision about Christ, he continued to prefer personal pleasure at the expense of a follower of God, the expense of Paul. A person suffering from procrastination or delaying decisions casually dismisses God's call through Christ by not saying yes and not saying no. They just don't answer which ultimately is saying no. Therefore, morality suffers because the truth is not in them. Thirdly, this morning, from the example of Felix, we find that procrastination postpones this decision of faith as well. Third item mentioned in verse 25, Paul presents righteousness, self-control, and then he says, a judgment to come. Now the Bible that we know to be true speaks of judgment that will come. Christ Himself spoke of it in Matthew chapter 25 where He talks about separating the sheep and the goats. To Felix, apparently he was dealing with a tremendous amount of accountability that he did not want to deal with. He told Paul, go away, and when he had a more convenient time, he would call upon Paul to again share with him the way. I want you to note this about Felix's life. If you note nothing else, I want you to grasp this. Felix delayed the greatest opportunity he ever had in his life when he said, come back a more convenient time. We have no record of Felix ever becoming a believer. He postponed a decision concerning his faith Apparently, according to verse 26, he did send for Paul to come and talk with him again. But we're not told that he was ever quite moved like he was this first time. I want you to think about that for a moment, that if, as Paul speaks, and he speaks about the way, he speaks about Jesus Christ to him and how grace and mercy works in his life. As Paul speaks to Felix about that, and Felix becomes convicted, and he just can't say no, and he ultimately says, go away, and I'll call you a more convenient time. 
And then he calls him back again, but he's never really moved to that moment in time again. He's never really under that kind of conviction again, like he was. This makes us wonder that maybe the more we hear the gospel, the more we refuse to embrace it, it may lead us down a road of more easily refusing it at a later time. In other words, when God calls, there's an urgency for us to respond. Procrastination can be tragic. As we said, we have no record of Felix ever accepting Christ. In 1862, America was deeply entrenched in the Civil War, and it was in September of that year that two Union soldiers found a copy of of Confederate General E. Lee's battle plan. And so these soldiers quickly forwarded it to the Union General, George McClellan. And the Union forces outnumbered the Confederate forces at this time three to one. They were near Sharpsburg, actually, in Maryland. Lee's army was divided, and it was very vulnerable at this point in time. And, of course, they had the battle plans for him as well. So McClellan had a decisive advantage with these plans and also the size of his troops. President Abraham Lincoln urged McClellan to attack, but the general hesitated. Because of this, General Lee was able to, able to maneuver his forces. The Battle of Antietam took place And at the conclusion of that, 23,000 soldiers actually lost their lives. If McClellan had acted quickly and not delayed, he probably could have spared many individuals' lives by having a deciding victory quickly instead of it continuing on. You see, there's physical consequences to, to procrastination. Like we can't just procrastinate and nothing happens. It just all continues to go great. There's a physical consequence to this as well. But spiritually, in our life, Christ may stir our heart to accept Him as Savior, but just as with Felix, procrastination tells us to wait until a better occasion. Today, you may be sitting... Maybe not on the end of the pew, toward the middle of a pew somewhere. You may be on the end, but you may be in the back. And God's speaking to your heart right now. But you look around and you say, you know, I'd have to walk over about three or four people to get out. I'll just wait till I'm sitting on the end one day. Or maybe you've looked at your watch. Y'all can all go ahead and do that if you want. And he said, you know, if I, if I go, it's going to delay service a little bit. I'll tell you this, the most important decision you'll make is to delay service. Christ may also stir your heart to speak to someone about Christ, to share the love of Christ with others. But procrastination says, relax, take it easy. You've got plenty of time to talk to them. They'll be tomorrow. Christ may actually stir our heart to help someone in need. But procrastination says you've got plenty of things of your own to do. There'll be another day you can help them. See, if you're struggling with delaying something that needs or should have your immediate attention, Why not remove the shackles that Satan provides of procrastination and accept Christ if he's calling to you today? Why not follow his instruction in how or what you do in life? And maybe today we've we've geared our message a little more toward an unsaved type audience or unsaved type individual. But I want you to understand too, that even as a believer, at each new level of discipleship, we find procrastination can shut us down. Maybe I'm called to sing a special. 
Hadn't done that before. Maybe it's a, like a next level discipleship kind of thing in our life. But because of kind of fear, we just said, I, I'll do that another time. Maybe we've been called to you know, start reading our Bible more, studying more, and having kind of some Bible discussions within our family. But we always find something else to do. Like there, There's always something going on. And so therefore we kind of put it off. That's discipleship to the next level and we just procrastinate. You see, procrastination is not just about becoming saved. It's also about advancing in our life in Christ. So I'd ask you, where are you today? First and foremost, are you a believer in Jesus Christ? And if not, why not today? You see, there's nothing standing in your way except you yourself. Christ is willingly waiting with outstretched arms. If you remember the story of the prodigal son's father, Think about the father. He longed for his son to come. He saw him at a far distance, and what does he do? He runs out to him. And when he gets there, what does he do? He tells his people to plan a feast, because my child has come home. Are you ready to come home today? Home to a place that God created for you to be, in a right relationship with him. Maybe you've been saved for a period of time. But you've just kind of set it on a shelf. You've not went forward with it in any way. You've just kind of said, yes, I do believe in Jesus Christ. Oh, heartily do, but, but you know, I, I just am busy with the world. Maybe today you need to say, you know, God, whatever it is in my life that you want me to do, I'm willing to go. I'm willing to serve. I'm willing to listen and follow you every step of my walk as we stand together this morning if God's speaking to your heart today would you respond in this moment in time as we pray dear Heavenly Father we come to you thanking you for this day that you've given us Lord and this time we have Lord we know this time is a gift It's a gift that you've given to each one of us. And, and Lord, you know exactly where we are in our life. And for some reason, you've brought us here this morning. For some reason, you have us standing right where we are. For some reason, you've actually maybe moved within our heart in the way that you have. So today, Lord, we pray that we would set procrastination aside and we would do whatever it is in our life that you've been leading and calling us to do. We pray this in your son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen.